Good to see Sister Doreen back. Um, Sister Doreen had a real serious bout of the dengue. It's good to see her back. My mom as well, and many of you. Uh, Dawn, dengue has been all about Nassau causing mischief, and uh, we're grateful that God is greater still. Uh, of course, Sister Laura has been welcome back. Who, who else has been traveling we haven't seen for a couple of weeks? You're back. We want to make sure that we greet you, those who have been traveling and have returned. Anybody? Any families? Okay. It's, yeah, Steph inside, right? Welcome back, right? There, there they are. That's why I couldn't see you over here. <laughs> okay. Um, how many more students do we have left who are leaving and, and um, uh, leaving sometime this week and we, haven't, uh, we need to give you your goodbyes? Any students leaving or are they all left? They're all gone. All right. Okay. Well. What's that? Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm being told by Elder Cyril Pete that a big faux pas took place last week. Charlie, is that you? Come back, come back out here. Just, just step out. I'm being told that Charlie and Angela, Elder Emeritus Charles Randolph Wallace and Anne Angela McCartney Wallace celebrated 50 years of marriage. And we want to have that beautiful lady stand. Charlie, stand. In fact, come up here. Let, let, let the people look on you. Let them gaze on you. Come. Come here. <laughs> come here. <laughs> what you say? You'll stand up? OK. You can you get away with standing up. 50 years. They have three beautiful children, all of who are serving the Lord. Plenty, plenty, plenty in this church. Let your children stand up. <laughs> Sister Charlene, Brother Carvel Wallace in the back. I think Sister Kayla is serving in the back somewhere. And Lord, how many grandchildren now? One, two, five grandchildren. Praise the Lord. May your tribe continue to increase. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Bless you all. Just a word of prayer for the saints. We know you've been all over the place. Uh, Andy and Nancy were in danger of losing their home by fire. Um, Brother Avery decided he wanted to jump from two stories to test to see if his ankles could take the weight. I, I don't know what that was all about. Um, and uh, uh, others of you have found yourself buffeted about by one thing or another. We just want to commit ourselves to the Lord, ask his blessing over our lives, our welfare, and our homes. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful that you are such a good God. You have preserved and kept us. You've watched over our homes, and you've blessed us. Thank you for those who are here present today. They went through a bout of dengue, and they're here. Um, I look at Brother Ram and... and Beryl, hearing that report by Pastor Hannah, where we're stunned at the level of how bad that was. Sister Doreen and Pastor Rex, uh, my mother and others, found themselves struggling under the weight of that terrible burden. And Lord, one of our former members, we're told, has uh, succumbed, perhaps to dengue or something else. We don't have the full report yet. Bonnie Adams, we're praying for her family members, um, Sister Barbara, her sister, and others who are mourning her passing. Lord, we want to remember Brother Herbie and, and his weakened condition because of dengue as well, and uh, we recognize that he's really been struggling. Thank you that he's on the mend. Uh, continue to watch over their home, help them as they would do some reshingling work. Um, and Lord, for all of us here, those coming through one bit of illness or another, we want to remember Pastor Lee, uh, convalescing from open heart surgery. We pray, Lord, that you would spare this man and answer his prayer and give him that, uh, that Caleb uh, response that in, 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 in his latter years, he can do even greater things for you. So we pray that you'd preserve and keep him. Give him back his health, his, his, his breath, and uh, may he continue to lead this country in righteousness and holiness. For Brother Aaron Fowler, coming through the terrible ordeal he went with. Is, is Brother Aaron here? Aaron Fowler, is he in the church? 
want to remember him, what he went through, and thank you that he's on the mend, Lord. Um, be with Sister Bonnaby as she is still dealing with the loss of her husband. We want to remember Brian Clark, Dwight Bain, Jeanette Peart, Dolores Bethel, and Nadine Knowles, all of whom are in a state of bereavement with their family members. Remember those in our out islands struggling under the devastation of Irene and her wrath. Uh, those in Acklands, Crooked Island, and Agua, Cat Island, and other places, Lord, we're still finding out the extent. And help us as we uh, give focus to helping out one or two of these islands by the means uh, that you give us to do so, be that in monetary funds, clothing, or perhaps even later, uh, having some of our persons go down and maybe assist in building of some kind. Thank you for the opportunity to be with the Attorney General's office. We recognize that, Lord, having prayed over the various governments of this country for the better part of seven plus years, it seems it only makes sense that when there was a need, they called on the, uh, the church who had borne them up near and dear in their hearts for so long. We thank you, Lord, that you often make us who pray the answer to our prayers. May you continue to help us to be the people of God who are mobilized and ready to bring about your will and your perfect plan in this world that we live in. We pray that your kingdom come on earth, but Lord, we pray your kingdom would come specifically to the Bahamas, that we would be a nation that loves you, that honors you in all that it does, where we respect each other, we respect the laws of the land, we have godly or at least God-fearing leaders who are doing things to the betterment of the nation, and nothing with short-term goals that bring long-term destruction. To this end, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, our Christ, our Savior, and soon-coming King. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, as I mentioned during the communion, today we begin a stewardship series entitled, Just Who is the Real Owner of Your Life? You see, folks, as Pastor Hannah was saying, where this technically is the start of our church calendar year. Uh, January is not really a start. January, we've just quickly come back from all the ho holidays, but there's this two and a half to three month break where our ministries have ceased. Uh, of course, short term missions and camp ministries continue to go on and other sorts of things, but, but actually the church's restart and reemphasis begins in September. And so we recognize the need for much prayer. But also with prayer, our consecration, our, our recommitment, our rededication to the Lord for the purpose of service. You see, your old commitments, perhaps some of us have made decisions many, many years ago, and uh, there's, there's, we've been for the last couple of years coasting perhaps in our own strength and maybe... Um, some barnacles of fatigue and bitterness have built up and so forth, and we've lost the focus of why we do it. It's so important for us to understand that we've been called into relationship with Jesus Christ, called into service, called into ministry, and our lives belong to him. And so I hope today to help us to once again feel that wonderful sense of being God's people, who are mobilized and ready to be committed wherever God would place them. You see, I don't know where God wants to place you. I know that he expects us to be involved in ministry to the church here among uh, ourselves and, and within our community, but also ministry outside the church. And God has a plan for all of us and how he wants to do that. Begin with a reading of Mark 8, 34 through 38. Here's what the scriptures say. Then he, Jesus, called a crowd to him, along with his disciples and said this. If anyone would come after me, he must. You can underline this in your Bible. He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If, conditional, if anyone course we can put our name there if anyone would come after me okay if we if we're going to come alongside as those who are saved and his disciples if anyone would come after me here is 
a requirement. Here's a prerequisite. He, she must deny himself. Oh, what a word to an age that demands things for itself. What an age we live in that says, me, 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 my way. I did it my way. God says the way of the kingdom is deny yourself. And rather than seeking pleasure, he says, take up your cross and follow me. And then to, 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 to put it in context, he goes further. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus is here giving us some paradigms that we're not, we don't think in these categories. Deny? No, no, no. We live in an age of demand. Self-sacrifice? No, 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 no. We live in an age where I want it for me. Give up? No, 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 no. Get, get, get more, more, and more. But brothers and sisters, I want to help you to understand we've been called out of the world to be a different people who the world looks at and says, what manner of people are these? And people become thirsty for God by what they see in us because we're such a counterculture people. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for me and for the sake of the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his very own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Amen. Do you hear how powerful these words of Jesus are? They confront us where we are. They confront us on the street with which we live. We're not used to hearing someone call us to this kind of life. And friends, you know, some bits of scripture you, you really don't want to be confronted by. Some of them sound odd, some sound strange, but listen to the conditions of this one. You will follow Jesus? Denial of your life is key. You want to be his follower? Lose your life for his sake and find out that you've actually gained it more and more and more. I'm going to develop this a bit more. So if this sounds hard, you, you'll see what this flashes out and what it looks like. Let's see if I can break it down a bit for you. If this present life is the most important thing for you, you will do everything you can to protect your life. If your opinion, if your belief, if your worldview is that this life is the only thing that is important, these words will fall on willfully deaf ears because you will hold on to the thing that you believe is most dear and most valuable. And so right away, you are confronted immediately with a big, big issue, self-preservation or following after God's will. Am I clear yet? You will do everything you can to protect and to hold on to what you believe real life is. Real life as you know it. If having the world's prestige and being liked by the world is important to you, you are absolutely not going to do anything for Jesus that will make you look like a crazy, uncouth Christian. Now mind you, some people are crazy, uncouth Christians, not because God called them to be that, but they're a little off. So we're not necessarily going there. Friends, if this present world and its accolades are important to you, you will not do anything that might endanger your safety, health, and comfort. No mission trips for you, as you might find yourself in unsafe, unhealthy, and uncomfortable places. You see, self-preservation rather than the will of God becomes paramount and key. I'm not saying to foolishly cast yourself in harm's way. That's not what I'm saying. But when God speaks to us and we say, no, Lord, because of something we believe to be dangerous or we don't like it or that's not where about, then we're not going to find ourselves stretched to do ministry. The average person did not like the ministry that God brought them into. But try and take them out of it now. Try and take them out of it now. 
They've developed God's heart for that ministry. They love it. They love the people that they serve and minister to. Some people can't get involved in a ministry because they're afraid. While we were on this mission trip to um, Jacques Mel, Haiti, we were hosted by a woman who ought not to be alive. Ought not to be alive. She had the Stephen Johnson's disease. You know that disease that children get and, and, and the, the skin begins to sloth off and blindness and all of that. She had that as a child. Had that as a child. You hear me? As a child. Children die from that. She's living. In fact, the 23 people in her community that had it, she was the only one that lived. Right? She's lost the sight of one eye, but she's alive. She had a horrible, horrible child upbringing. She was abused, molested as a child. But God has taken this broken down woman, this woman rejected by society, and because of this woman and her presence and her, ability, her willingness to give herself completely to God, to lose herself in God, because of this woman and her faith and willingness to trust God, God has placed her in Haiti where she is responsible right now for a school that educates a thousand Haitian children. Right now. Right now. She has, she has been the means by which this beautiful strong edifice that no earthquake or, 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 or hurricane has in any way damaged. Beautiful sight to see. A thousand students. A hundred persons are employed because of her. She has an orphanage for little girls who might have be sacrificed or turned into prostitution at a young age. Because of her, she is saving young children, little boys and little girls who could be molested and turned into, into other things. She is making sure that, um, that persons are fed. Mothers, there's a milk program, but it's more than just the giving of milk. It's other things. She's teaching hygiene and all of these things. Why? Because, you know, she let God take her brokenness, her life that anybody would have cast her aside and say, you have nothing to offer. But she's turned that over to God, and God has built out of this woman a monument to himself. Monument to herself. Can the mission team give me at least an amen? amen. If nobody else can. It's an amazing thing. We're watching these little girls, because um, we stayed at the place where the little girls were, um, watching them learn manners, learn, watch them learn how to pray, and and be given chores to do, and just, just a wonderful thing to behold. One little child with HIV, um, just, it was, a, it was a beautiful thing for us to be a part of that and to see that. But it could only be because she died to herself, she died to her shame, she died to her pain, gave it to God, and God made of her a mighty, mighty woman. Now, some of us, to become true servants of Christ, will need to die to our pride. Some may need to die to their shame. Some may need to die to... You got it? None of us comes to these moments the same. But all of us must die to self. Die to self that we might truly live. Christ's command is so clear. To follow him and be effective for his kingdom, you have to deny yourself. More than that, you must die to the false system of belief that gave you comfort and ego satisfaction. One commentator put it this way, when it comes to serving the Lord, you may risk death, but you will never fear it because you know that Jesus will raise you to eternal life. Nothing material can compensate for the loss of eternal life. Jesus' disciples are not to use their lives on earth for their own pleasure. They should spend their lives serving God and people. He concludes by stating, we should be willing to lose our lives for the sake of the gospel, not because our lives are useless, but because nothing, not even life itself, can compare to what we gain with Christ. Jesus wants us to choose to follow him rather than lead a life of sin and self-satisfaction. He wants us to stop trying to control our destiny and let him direct us. This makes good sense because as a creator, Christ knows better than we do what, the real, what real life is about. He asked for submission, not self-hatred. He asked us only to lose our self-centered determination to be in charge. Amen. So I ask the question, who is the owner of your life? If you say Christ, can you honestly say you die to yourself daily? If you say Christ is the owner of your life, can you honestly say that you die to yourself daily? I won't take a poll. 
because I can assure you, little to none of us would be, be the response. Are you actively denying the world that controlled you before you came to Christ for the gospel's sake? I must confess, I don't see many Christians who have died to self and are truly following after Christ's example. Are you losing your life for Christ? John 12, 24 through 26, Jesus elaborates on the point of dying to self when he says, I tell you the truth. That, that always gets me when Jesus says that. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You think he got to say, I tell you the truth? Some versions say, truly, truly. That's the NASB that I grew up reading. Truly, truly, I say to you. Other versions translate it, I tell you the truth. Friends, if the truth talking to you, and he putting in front of his first words, I tell you the truth. This is key. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. Now, friends, I want you to do something. Underline this passage in your Bible. One thing I know about us, we like to underline promises. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and then underlining stuff. <laughs> or we might go to and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. But friends, there's some things that we're called to that need to be underlined too. Be careful of this underlining only what catches your ear. Underline what you know to be God speaking to you. Now, friends, I am, in, I am purposely not speaking in a powerful way because these scriptures are powerful enough. And they don't need no inflection from me to carry weight. They are powerful, are they not? I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And now Jesus makes the application. Verse 25. The man who loves his life will lose it. While the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me and where I am my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Friends, I'm grateful for this church that taught me that I needed to die to myself. That was further enhanced and elaborated when I went off to college within two weeks of my salvation and came out of the ministry of Camps Crusade and Navigators where I understood fully, you have got to die. You have got to die to yourself and live to the praise of his glory. Oh, there were some rough years. And sometimes you gotta work out what that truly looks like. Sometimes I was, I was so heavenly minded I wasn't even any earthly good. But you, you begin to understand uh, who you are and who you can become in Christ. And because I die to myself, I believe is the only reason I could have ever arrived at this place. Where God can take out of a heart that has had to die to self, die to self-will, die to your own plans, die. Uh, and, and, you know, you try to die daily, but we're human. God has tried to form Christ in me that he might give me and to give all of us who are living like that more ministry. And what does he do it? That he might get glory out of our lives. Friends, he cannot get glory out of a life he does not own. He cannot get glory out of a life that is not submitted to his will. He cannot. But a life that is given over to his will, a life that is surrendered to his will, he can get much glory because that life is transformed into a Christ-like image that he can do much good and many things with. Here in the Gospel of John, Jesus goes even further and reveals that the real value of dying to yourself by comparing the process of a kernel of wheat dying buried deep in the ground. The only way that one kernel can reproduce itself so that many more are fed is to die to self. He goes further with the illustration of adding that the man who loves his life and tries to pursue his goals will actually end up losing all that he has that he thinks he's trying to gain. In fact, in Luke 17, 32 through 33, he brings in Lot's wife as an illustration of this when he says, remember Lot's wife, 
Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. Now, what does Jesus mean? Remember, the angels had to go into Sodom. They were originally just going to destroy it, but because of the prayer of Abraham, they're not just going to destroy it. They're looking for ten righteous. And they know right away where to go, Lot. Lot. We know that Lot is righteous. And so they go to Lot's house. And going to Lot's house, we, we know that um, Lot had two daughters and some other daughters and some other sons. How many, we don't know. But we know that he had them and that they were married. And so, no doubt, Abraham is assuming, under my nephew Lot, I'm sure him and his children and their spouses are all saved. That's ten there, so, so Sodom is saved. No, friends, that hasn't happened. And he could only find, the angels only find four. And of those four, only three are really willing to leave. And the whole time, the angels are pulling. Literally, it grabs, the angels grab Lot and his wife and children and rush them out of the city. Because disaster is about to fall. But we hear, Lot's wife lingered. Lingered. She lingered. She couldn't let go of the wealth and the prestige of Sodom and was reluctant to leave it. Even then, even though the angels pulled her out of the city, she kept on lagging further and further behind. Taking one step forward, maybe two or three back to lament and say, oh, but what about my China? Oh, but what, what, what? who knows what was in the woman's heart? But she lagged behind as Lot and his daughters went, got further and further and further away and Lot saying, honey, honey, Mrs. Lot. Wish we knew what her name is. Mrs. Lot, come. Lottie, <laughs> come. But folks, because Lot's wife could not let go of Sodom. When judgment fell, she was in the blast radius of God's judgment and was incinerated. You've seen those atomic bombs dropping where you see um, human figure literally just be reduced to dust on its feet. Same thing happened here. Let me state it again. Nothing material can make up for the loss of eternal life. There was nothing in Sodom that should have so gripped her heart that she couldn't leave it and know that she was walking in the plan and the will of God. Friends, there has to be a marked difference in attitude and thought if we would become the people of God. You can't hold on to two cow tails. You cannot love the world and love the Lord. You cannot, cannot do it. I've tried. And felt like my arms were being pulled out of the socket. You can't hold on to two cow tail. Not one of you could hold back one cow. Imagine you're all trying to keep two cow in place. Can't happen. The Apostle Paul understood and accepted this call of Jesus to live a life that denied the power and prestige of the past in order to live for Jesus. He states in Philippians 3, 4 through 9. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Bring your, bring your arguments, bring your accolades. I'll tell you, I could surpass all of them. I was circumcised on the eighth day. People of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee. Better off than them jokey Herodians who half, half Greek, ain't know what they for. Uh, the Sadducees who don't even honor the word of God, much better than them. I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. As for zeal, I was so zealous, I put my beliefs into practice. I persecuted the church that I believed to be the enemy. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. I seemingly was able to keep the law of God. But then he says this, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my loss, my Lord, for whom I, I, I consider all things rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is derived from the law, but a righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul gave it all up. He recognized that holding on to the prestige of being these things kept him from recognizing who Jesus was. Jesus? You mean that jokey fella down there from Kemp Road? Jesus? What school he gone to? He ain't got to no school. And on top of that, I hear 
Ma was running around on the par before they got married, so he's a bastard child. You got it? You see, his legalistic, or all of his pedigree and prestige, he couldn't recognize the plan of God that was revealed right there in his Bible. Right there in his Bible. Couldn't see it. Because of his own self-righteousness, his own pride. No way this guy could be no, um, uh, no uh, um, prophet of God. A little hick town that he grew up in. But he looked a little deeper. He would realize this fella was born of a virgin, as Isaiah said he should be. This fella um, was born in Bethlehem itself. So friends, I believe like Paul, we could have too much self-centeredness, too much stock in who we are, feel that we are this and we are that, and we can't lose that to become a Christian. If you know how many times I heard, boy, don't be stupid. Only people who can't get no job elsewhere has become a pastor. Only people who, who don't have much education. That's how low and the esteem of being a pastor is in this country. Of course, I'm talking 25 years ago. Only people who don't have nothing else to do or who are looking for easy ways to get money. Boy, you got too much education for that. You got too much sense for that. Help the church out on the side. You see, friends, if you let pedigree, and the same thing happened with Brother Rex when, he, when God was calling him into the ministry. This fellow was a um, principal of a high school at the age of 18. And he could lose, he could give up all that to be a part of a jokey sect and even a real church. Not the good, decent Anglican church, it's a jokey church. Brethren, something or other, they, they call them. Do you understand me? And if we let our sense of, of uh, well, we are, we're too big for this and, and God can't expect me to give this up or that up, friends, you will never know soul satisfaction. And you will come to the end of your days disappointed regretful that you did not have more to give God. And God would have us to look at our lives and say, is this really serving me? Do you believe you should give to me that which has cost you nothing? Friends, I wouldn't want any one of us to be in a place where we will hear God say, you've given me that which cost you nothing, whereas I gave you heaven's best. My, my, my. Friends, the word of God is true and you must accept it if you are going to become the person that God has made you to be. The Apostle John, speaking to this issue, writes in 1 John 2, 15 through 16, do not love the world or anything in the world. Don't love its prestige. Don't love its accolades. Don't love its enticements. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. You see, the devil uses the world and its enticements to stop our forward progress in the faith. I disciple men for about five years. And every time I knew when a man was growing and following me and when a man was in trouble. And every time some woman came along and I watched that fella disappear. Watched him disappear. One particular time I said, friend, you see how deep we're getting with the Lord. You see what God is requiring of you. If you don't find this interesting that this drop dead, gorgeous, knockout woman has decided to enter into your life right about now? And do you really think she can help you in your spiritual growth right now? You know, a man saying that to another man, it might look like he's trying to cut in on his. So after a while, I had to leave it alone. But you know what? He, he, uh, I don't even know if he's in church now. You got me? You see, there are times in your life where you are in a period of growth. And God is at work in your life. 
And now is not the time for you to have loyalties for anything else. If you want to hear from the Lord, you've got to be naked before the Lord, not naked before no one else. Yeah, bird came and picked the seed. Exactly, Charles. Exactly. Brothers and sisters, you're going to love the world or you're going to love God. That's what I'm getting at. You're going to love the world or you're going to love God. One or the other. No man can serve two masters. Not you, not me, no one. He will love one and despise the other. Which one is it for you? Do you resent being a Christian? Do you resent that being a Christian is keeping you from your quote-unquote goals? Friends, if being a Christian is keeping you from some goal, I put it to you, your goals are wrong. That is so cut and dried, so plain and simple to me, it could not even be described any better. If being a Christian is keeping you from some goal, my friends, that goal is a devilish enticement to destroy you. Well, I wish I had a church in here that might back up something if I said with sense. Here's why I say that cannot be of God. The Bible says that God will withhold no good thing from those he loves. If you believe something is good for you, and God believes that thing is good for you, God will ensure that you get it at a time that is right. But if you have concluded that you being a Christian will hinder you getting that, I tell you right now, it ain't for you. It's not in God's plan for you. I put it to you that your soul will never know true satisfaction until you determine that you can absolutely trust God with your life. But here's a problem. You're born with a sinful nature that absolutely does not trust God. In fact, the Bible says that your flesh is hostile to the things of God. You have a choice to make. Will you believe your own sinful human nature or the one who says, I have come that you may have life and have that more abundantly? I can show you in my journal the things that I had to hear God and say no to. But I can show you in my journal the glory of having said no and walking with God and seeing God open up a whole vista of ministry and opportunities and experience the Spirit's power in my life that I would not have experienced before had I not said to God, not my will, but thy will be done having not made a choice to die to self. And many of you sitting here know of what I speak. You have to make a choice. Live for self and all its distorted passions or live for God. Let me cite the words of Jesus for you again. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel's sake will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his very own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I call on you today to make a decision. If Jesus is who he says he is, then commit to serving him with all your heart. Don't be half-hearted or lukewarm in your devotion to him. Learn to resist the pull and the status of the world. Ask God to help you to die to the world's glitz and glamour and to sin's attraction. Ask him. If any man asks of God, God will give it to him. The only time you know God's not going to give you something is if you're going to spend it foolishly on your pleasures. But if you're saying, God, free me of the ties of this world that are seeking to devour my soul, trust me, he can help you. Trust me. I like what Richard Havison, former chaplain of the U.S. Senate, has said. Uh, you've heard me say this before. Each day before I leave my study, I ask God to wear me like a garment. Here's what he means. My clothes are nothing in themselves. They are inanimate. And when I take them off, they can't stand up or walk or do anything on their own. They collapse. I want to be like that in relation to Jesus. I want my only animation to be Christ who lives in me. Who, and I think his thoughts, desire his will, and love his love through me. I thought that was an interesting illustration. We must be able to declare, as Paul did, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. 
I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. I've died to myself. I've died to self-will. That's what Paul is saying. Brother Dave, who was one of those who was in my discipleship group for a number of years, Dave has been steadfast, unmovable. He's one of those men who the word of God went deep in him, and he has been a leader wherever he goes. He's a, he's a beloved leader in this church. Dave learned the value of crucifying himself, that Christ would live through him. The other person I mentioned to you lived for this world. Two men, same materials, but one was not prepared to die to self. One was prepared to live for the pleasures of this world. The other said, absolutely not. And I don't think anyone could deny that God has blessed David Shannon, Dave Shannon Smith innumerably, giving him a choice wife uh, that he can love, whose fellowship he treasures, and uh, God is a good God. But Dave held the line. He, I will serve Christ. I will be, Christ will be my Lord. I am his servant. His will, not my will, be done. So I, I say that just to juxtapose that against the, the other one who in the study said no to the plan and will of God in his life. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul reveals how we can remain free of the pull of the world when he says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Here's a key. No soldier in active services entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. We must understand that we are under authority. We are owned by the Lord. We are soldiers under authority. Our will is not our own. If a soldier leaves the base and he has not been told to, he is AWOL. He is absent without leave for which you are punished. You see, but we live in an easy believism Christianity that says, listen, I could say I'm Christian and do as I please. No friends, not my, my Bible don't say that. My Bible suggests that, not suggests, clearly states that people, that Christians are people who are, uh, live under the authority and the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit. They recognize that their lives are not their own, but they belong to Jesus Christ and they do what he says to do, whether it's comfort or not. They're not trying to hold on to what the world gives them. They let it go that God may give them more than they ever could have gotten had they kept on holding on to their lives. And the scriptures tell you that. Anyone who gives up mother, father, sister, brother, these things will get more and beyond that eternal life. And so God is not in the business of deprivation for deprivation's sake. God will not allow us to have any idol. It's the first commandment all over again. It's the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other God before me. It's just the New Testament has fleshed that out, that's all. And you know what the other gods are? The love of this world, the love of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. These are gods. And God says, I will have nothing of it. They will take you away from me. And so we're called to um, love the Lord and uh, serve him. Uh, our time is ended. Let me just say one or two more things as we close. Sometimes the choices are not necessarily between good and bad, but good and not necessarily for you. Here are a few questions you can ask yourself to aid in determining what you should be involved in. Will the activity bring, will being in this activity dull your senses to spiritual things? Will it dull your senses to spiritual things? It isn't of God. Will it make you less effective for his service? Will it keep you distracted, unfocused, too unalert to perceive the enemy's schemes in your life and in the life of your family? Will it may bring you to a place where you're too consumed to hear God's trumpet call to arms against the enemy? The right of Hebrews may help us in knowing how to conduct ourselves in this regard, for he says in 12, 1 through 2, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses before us, surrounding us, 
let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangled us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the question as we close, what are some encumbrances that are keeping you ineffective from being a true servant, truly owned by the Lord? One commentator on this passage writes, the Christian life is hard work. It requires us to give up whatever endangers our relationship with God, and that's all it's about. Whatever endangers our relationship with God, or to run patiently and to struggle against sin with the power of the Holy Spirit. To live effectively, we must keep our eyes on Jesus. We will stumble if we look away from him or stare at ourselves or at the circumstances surrounding us. We should be running for Christ, not ourselves. We must always keep him in sight. So what are the encumbrances? The things that can get in the way of keeping us on fire for the Lord. And what are some of the weights for us to close? What are some of the weights that are keeping us from serving the Lord? Remember, put aside encumbrance, throw off every weight. What are they? Well, a weight might be unforgiveness of those who have hurt you. That's a weight for many people. That's a weight for plenty of people. Things that have hurt you, things that have pained you. I was watching a program the other day. Oh, I wish I could remember what it was, but the, 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 the person in the role of the I mean, it might have been Medea goes to jail, I think it was, where, where, where my wife and I, my wife's been on a Medea kick lately, and we just watched that one the other day, but there, there was a social worker, uh, a Christian pastor, woman, who had been a prostitute for 16 years, crack addict, everything, and God brought her out of that life. And um, she was preaching in the prison to some women who had gone there, Medea being one of them, and she was telling one particular girl, I can't do that, I can't forgive my father. And the prison chaplain was saying, um, if you don't forgive him, the only one who will stay broken is you. That forgiveness was a way out of that and the path for healing to help her to grow and so forth. And this, this woman, the, the, the woman who was preaching, that had been her own story. And out of her brokenness, out of all of these things, having learned to forgive, she became, she became a vessel of cleansing for many. A powerful person that God can use. So, unforgiveness those who have hurt you. Anger towards God. That's why I tell people, you always hear people say when I was growing up, you can't be angry at God, you can't fly in God's face. Oh really? That person need to get that pain of their anger out of God. They need to get that out. They need to get that out. Let them get it out, but by means of a Christian worker or a pastor who can help them come to grips with that. But don't tell them they can't be angry, you compound in the pain. Be angry, but don't sin in your anger, my Bible says. Got it? So we have to help people get past their unforgiveness, past their anger, uh, anger towards God, yourself, or others, disappointment in a relationship. Some people have never moved past a broken relationship. Baggage from your past, disobedience to your parents or to your pastor or those that God has placed in authority over you. Staying in any of these states will cripple your ability to run the Christian life effectively. Okay, our time is gone. I will continue next week, but here's what I want to say. We will remain broken, useless, haughty, angry, selfish, unproductive, ineffective, of no value, and a blockage to the grace of God that wants to flow unless we die to self. I want to encourage you in this next week Perhaps I can send a skeleton uh, of my notes through the email for you to dwell on the scriptures. But ask yourself in this week to come, put, put these matters before the Lord and ask the Lord some simple questions. Or ask yourself, is God really the head of my life? Who is really in charge? Has God been asking me to let something go when I know I'm still holding on to it? I want you to allow the Spirit of God to talk to you this week. Say to, say to God's Spirit, Lord Pastor Lyle has said some hard words, but they were all from you. 
I know that you are calling us to live a certain kind of life, but God, that's a challenge for me, and I'm afraid. Spirit of God, search me and help me that by means of this time together, this series, you would own my heart completely. I don't want to press you to a response today. I want you to let this marinate in you. Because friends, the man or woman convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. And if I could, by means of trickery, persuasion, force you to take a step of absolute surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you did that for vain glory because people were watching, your life's not gonna change much. But if you've taken time to be before the Lord and the Lord says, I need you to give this to me, and I know and you know, that don't go down like that. There needs to be time for you to say, yes, Lord, I surrender all with a full knowledge that that means surrender of this relationship, that it means surrender of this kind of a lifestyle, surrender of this. Brothers and sisters, I want to call this church. If we would be more effective, listen, uh, a good friend on the radio says all the time, be the change you want to see. This nation is hellbound, heading to hell in a handbasket right now. People's attitudes are wrong, their convictions are wrong, their, their disposition about life is wrong. There's crime, violence, corruption on the streets. You want to see a change? Be the change. Be everything that Jesus would have you to be. Be that change. Let it start with you. And let it start with a surrendering of all that you are. Let's stand together as we sing the song, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me. Other people, come and help us at this time. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, hearts bowed, our spirits open. Let us take up that refrain, asking God to do just that. Oh, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Take these words, every one of them, from Jesus or the Apostle Paul and Peter, and help us, Lord, to look at our lives. May your Holy Spirit search our hearts. May your Holy Spirit Put a finger on those idols of our heart. May your Holy Spirit help us to know what you are calling us to. For Lord Jesus, you said, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Lord, there's no middle ground. There's no three areas for you, haven't made up my mind, and against you. For Lord, not to be for you is to be in the camp of against you. And so we must settle this issue of lordship and stewardship. Lord, we offer ourselves to you by your Holy Spirit's administration and ministrations in our lives. Help us to settle the issue of who will be Lord of our lives, ourselves, the devil, or you. Help us to settle this issue that you might control all that we are, you may have all that we are. And Lord, with the seed of our life dying, you can produce much fruit to the saving of many souls, to the enrichment of our lives beyond the poverty, the spiritual poverty we would have received. 
To this end, we commit ourselves. Be with us this week. Minister to us, I pray. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Our service is over, but your service to the Lord continues and remains. Go and serve the Lord. We invite our visiting guests to join us upstairs. We have light refreshments prepared for you. We'd like a few moments to get to know you and to uh, thank you for joining us and find out a little bit more about who you are, even as you find out who we are. The Lord bless you. Thank you. Once again, let's please make sure that our visiting guests get upstairs and we can spend a moment uh, greeting them and giving them some light refreshments and appreciating them for deciding to join with us here today.